So now that we have discussed task scheduling, let's look at how the tasks are created. Before we do that, let's look at heartbeat protocol. Heartbeat protocol is done periodically to indicate the health of task tracker. It is then used by job tracker as a failure detection mechanism. That is, a task tracker periodically sends heartbeat messages to the job tracker. Then the job tracker uses this heartbeat messages to find which task trackers are alive and which task trackers have failed. It is done using the remote procedural call. Uh, remote procedural call is uh, a simple concept. You can think that uh, think of it like a simple procedural call, except that there is a hidden mechanism and it is done on a on a remote node. Okay, so let's say that you have uh, this is a machine and this is another machine on a on a uh, on a network. Okay, uh, if you want to make a procedural call of a certain class in the same node, you just make a call, you know, you just call a function. But this is not that trivial when you're calling a class over the network, okay? To do that, um, there is uh, a mechanism, okay? Uh, so to do that, there is a stub here, it's called as a client stub, and there's another stub on a server, uh, server side. The client stub says to the server stub that, okay, call this uh, method on this class and then this uh, that method is invoked and the parameters are returned so for both uh, the job tracker and the task tracker it's almost as good as uh, the task tracker is calling a method of job tracker okay and since it's done remotely it's called as a remote procedure call uh, it's also important to note that the task tracker not only indicates the health but uh, it also sends some uh, send some messages uh, like you know uh, I have certain open slots and schedule them okay uh, that is you're piggybacking the directives from both the job tracker as well as task tracker and based on the directive the task trackers can uh, say, uh, say to the sorry the job tracker can say to the task tracker that launch a certain task or perform certain cleanup or a commit action so uh, cleanup action can be you know delete a certain task or a JVM or um, uh, clean up a certain directory. Commit tasks can be uh, for a given map. Uh, uh, commit the certain commit the output to a directory. That is, you copy the buffer into the uh, disk. So let's look at the remote procedural call in more detail. That is how the job tracker and task tracker communicate. The job tracker and task tracker communicate uh, through a client stub at the task tracker site. This client stub is called as job client. It is created using this code. Job client is of class inter tracker protocol and it is created using RPC dot wait for proxy. You supply the job tracker address in, in that method. Okay. Before you do that, you also have to ensure that the user of that particular job has proper permissions, okay? And which is done using this code. So that is RP, uh, that is task tracker is calling a method uh, heartbeat on job tracker using the job client. Then the job tracker in that method uh, determines whether uh, the whether to schedule a task or not. And if it determines that, okay, you have to schedule a task on a task tracker, it calls the task tracker uh, task schedulers assign task um, and the uh, task scheduler based on its internal scheduling logic returns the list of the task to the job tracker the job tracker then uh, returns this list of the task uh, using a heartbeat response that is you're piggybacking the directives using this protocol okay so let's look at uh, how the task tracker does this call okay and when does this uh, do this call so task tracker is basically has a runnable interface so it's so it creates a, a new ta a new thread and this thread is alive for its lifetime therefore there's a while loop until the task tracker is running okay uh, there's a while loop inside this method of a service which is the main method that keeps on running until the task tracker is alive so inside that method, it periodically sends heartbeat messages. Heartbeat messages is sent uh, 
using transmit heartbeat uh, function of the task tracker. Uh, inside that transmit heartbeat uh, function, it makes an RPC call uh, using the job client and it calls uh, the job tracker's heartbeat method. Okay, and then the job tracker returns the heartbeat response here. So, as I told earlier, you can piggyback directive. So the heartbeat response can have certain actions. Uh, and these actions are of type task tracker actions. Okay, these actions can be launch a certain task or commit a certain task. It can also be explicit clean up directory directive. Okay, which means that uh, delete a certain directory or kill certain task. Um, then the task tracker also checks whether the task it has already created are uh, alive or not. Okay. And if they are not uh, alive or if they are not responded after a certain amount of seconds, ma it marks them as unresponsive in and uh, into its internal structures. Okay. And then it kills any overflowing tasks. Okay. Uh, by overflowing, I mean uh, a certain tasks that are using a lot of disk space. Okay. And that is, the ta if the task tracker is running low on disk space, it kills certain tasks. Okay. Uh, the logic. Of killing task is also simple. It first tries to uh, check if there are reduced tasks running, and it kills them first. Okay, uh, the idea is uh, reduced tasks are usually uh, the ones that take a lot of disk space, hence uh, the task tracker first tries to kill them. And if if they are not running right, then it kills the one that has made the least progress. Now let's look at. Uh, the launch task action that is the, the task tracker has told the job tracker using the heartbeat that it has certain ta uh, slots open and then the job tracker uses the task scheduler and uh, finds out what are the tasks that it uh, that the task tracker has to run okay and then it communicates that back to the task tracker using the heartbeat response and in that heartbeat response there's an action launch task action okay So if the action is launch task action, then the task tracker uses two internal classes, uh, task launcher, and then, uh, so this task launcher has, are of two types, uh, map uh, launchers and reduce launchers. So that is, uh, uh, these two are fields of task tracker, and it creates uh, map task and reduce task differently. We'll talk about it later. So, uh, if the task is launch task action, it calls the launch task launcher and the task launcher then calls task in progress internal uh, launch task method. Okay, So task in progress, you can think of it uh, exactly same as job in progress, uh, except that uh, job in progress stores the information about the entire job and task in progress stores the information about that particular task. Okay. Uh, inside this launch task, uh, the task in progress calls uh, task runner. Okay, so essentially, if uh, the type of action specified by the job tracker is launch task action, then the task tracker calls the task runner to create a new task. It does so using runnable interface. That is, uh, a new thread is started. Um, so, since it's using runnable interface, the run method is called. Uh, inside that run method, uh, the task runner first launches uh, a new child JVM per task using the class JVM manager. Uh, it launches the new JVM because uh, it wants to shield the task tracker from any bug that can exist uh, in the map and reduce. Note that map and reduce are the user defined classes, hence, you don't know whether there is a bug in that uh, method or not. It just you just have to rely that uh, the user has written a proper map and reduce functions. Okay. So, since it's creating JVM, uh, JVM usually accepts uh, certain options, and these options are configurable. So, a user can specify the options using the property mapred.java.child.ops. Uh, the usual options that uh, the user can use are he, uh, heap size, specifying the heap, heap size or uh, 
garbage collection option. So you can specify the maximum heap size as well as initial heap size. You do so using uh, this string that is uh, xmx uh, certain value m. So this uh, this uh, string here says that at maximum uh, create the heap size of uh, 200m. Okay, that is 200 megabytes. Usually for data processing, you will keep uh, 1 GB. So uh, this will be 1 GB here. Okay. To control additional processes that a child JVM can create, uh, you use the property mapred.child.ulimit. Okay. So why do you need that, right? Uh, why do you need to limit the size of virtual memory when you have already specified the heap size? Well, uh, Hadoop allows you to create maps of different programming languages, not just Java. Okay, example Hadoop streaming. So in that case, if you just specify uh, the Java's maximum heap size, you are not controlling the virtual memory that uh, the, ma the uh, map that is written in C++ say uh, is using. So if you want to limit that as well, right? So you, are, you need to use mapred.child.ulimit. Well, uh, it, you can also have certain jobs that are short-lived, which means that uh, if if the ma if a running time of a job uh, running time of a task is extremely small, uh, even smaller than the time uh, creation time of a new JVM, then your your job will will be running really slow. So in that case, you can reuse your JVM. Uh, you can do so by specifying the property mapred.job.reuse.jvm.num task. Uh, the default value of uh, this property is 1. So if you specify, let's say, the property value is equal to 3, okay, you are specifying that uh, if uh, you start a JVM, then you assign it 3 tasks, okay, and each of those tasks are run sequentially. So uh, so task 1 is run inside that JVM, task 2 is the, uh, and the task 2 and task 3 wait until task 1 finishes and uh, once the task 2 1 finishes you start task 2 and so on and so forth. Well uh, so but it's important to note that uh, the task tracker can create multiple JVMs hence the process hence the task inside uh, two different JVM run parallelly. 